Good evening and welcome to the Lord's house and this uh, closing, of the ser- uh, closing of the Lord's day. Uh, we bring a few an- announcements to your attention. If you're visiting with us, we're glad you're here. You actually picked a good night to be here. Uh, tonight we have our pie social, so afterwards, after we uh, finish here and after the benediction, following the benediction, I will give you some instructions about how we are going to do this, and so I'll give you more details on that uh, afterwards. Uh, a couple of other things to keep in mind this week for the men. The men at the gates is on this again this week at 6 o'clock in the morning on Tuesday. Information's in your bulletin if you need more on that. Uh, Wednesday, we have our usual Wednesday night meeting this week as well. And again, uh, if you look in your bulletin, particularly those who are visiting with us, we encourage you to fill out one of those blue cards in the pew rack in front of you. You can put that in the offering plate or just hand it to us afterwards so that we can greet you personally. And then hopefully we can uh, escort you as well out to the Pi Social afterwards and get to know you better there as well. Uh, but also the bulletin has a lot of good information for uh, what's happening today at the church, but also this week and uh, the coming weeks as well, so you can get a little feel for uh, what things look like over this summer. We read in Psalm 37, verses 3 through 7, the following verses. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in the way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. In these few verses, we read at least seven imperatives. I think we could add more as well. But there are seven that are helpful as we prepare to enter into the presence of our Lord. I encourage you to think on these as we prepare for worship. These are some of the words. Trust. Dwell. Feed. Delight. Commit. Rest. And wait. Seven wonderful commands that encourage us to come before him clothed in Christ and expectant to leave changed having been with him. Prepare now your heart for worship. The Lord calls us to worship tonight from Psalm 86, verse 11. Teach me your way, O Lord, I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. When the infinite, eternal, joyful Lord calls you into his presence to worship, what's the appropriate response? 
joyful, thankful, immediate praise. Let's stand now and praise him with hymn number 288. We come, O Christ, to you. Hymn 288. standing as we uh, corporately confess our faith using that confession printed in your bulletin from the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 25. Brothers and sisters, what do you believe? The visible church, which is also Catholic or universal under the gospel, not confined to one nation as before under the law, consists of all those throughout the world that profess the true religion and of their children and is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ the house and the family of God out of which there is no ordinary possibility of salvation. Under this Catholic visible church Christ hath given the ministry, oracles, and ordinances of God of the saints in this life to the end of the world, and doth by his own presence and spirit, according to his promise, make them effectual there unto you. standing as we honor the reading of God's word out of 1 Corinthians 3 verses 9 through 17. It's our New Testament reading, 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 17. Hear now 
the authoritative, inerrant, infallible word of God. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds in this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Please be seated. As we watch the value of money decline from inflation due to economic mismanagement and overspending, isn't it good to know that the Lord manages his church and his kingdom with perfect wisdom and power? As we give tonight to the Lord's work, let us do so prayerfully entrusting him to build his kingdom to his glory, for his honor, and for the good of his people. Let us pray. Our Lord and Savior Jesus, we thank you for entrusting us with the means whereby we can honor you through our giving. May you be valued and honored tonight through the faithful giving of your people. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Please join with me now as we go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, you are the God who made the world and everything in it. You are the Lord of heaven and earth. You do not dwell in temples made with hands, for the universe itself could not contain you. You are not worshipped with men's hands as though you needed anything, since you give to all life, breath, and all things. We come before you this evening acknowledging your sovereign reign over all things, There is no part of the cosmos over which you do not have absolute authority. All creation is dependent upon you and answers to you and you alone. And yet this evening, as we reflect upon the magnificence of your being, the awesomeness of your power, the mystery of your self-existence, 
the unfathomable nature of your eternality and infinitude, the consuming purity of your holiness, the perfect unity and joy of the three persons of the Godhead, the unsearchableness of your transcendence. When we ponder these truths, we are overwhelmed because the scripture also reveals to us that you are also love, that you care for us as a father, his children. Little do we understand or truly grasp the depths of these truths. Little do we reflect upon the significance of these revelations. So this evening we ask that you graciously draw us near to you that we might know life and peace. Open our eyes to your majesty so that we will better understand your glory and beauty and splendor. Enlighten our minds so that we might know the brilliance of your being and the excellence of your works. Father, we bring these requests before you because we know that in and of ourselves we would not seek you. We would not seek you or seek to know you or your words or your works. Left to our own devices, we would submerge ourselves into sin and we would never surface were we not pulled from its depths by you. Our hearts are so quickly inclined to evil and we're completely dependent upon you for the quickening of our hearts and the enlightening of our minds. We acknowledge our waywardness and pettiness confess our ignorance and self-centeredness. Were we to know the true depths of our sin, we would shrink in shame and disgrace. And so we concede our sinfulness and sinful habits, and we ask you to forgive our sins on the basis of the work of Christ on our behalf. Take away our sins as far as the east is from the west and wash us so that we might be made more and more righteous, more fully reflect your glory to the surrounding world that is held in the grasp of the evil one. We understand that we do not deserve your forgiveness, but we plead for it through the blood of Christ, who died as our substitute. This evening we give you thanks. No matter what path you have chosen for us, we thank you that you do not leave us without hope, without truth, without your loving presence. We thank you that we can marvel in the work of Christ, the depths of his incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, and rule give us purpose and meaning in a world that is so dark and corrupt. We thank you for this local body of believers. We thank you for blessing Woodruff Road Presbyterian Church, the godly leaders and the faithful followers. We thank you for this location on a busy road that provides opportunity to draw in those who pass by. We thank you for this facility and providing a place of comfort so we can gather and hear your word taught and preached. We ask that you continue to provide for this church and that you guard the officers and members of this church from anything that would detract from our ministry to each other and to those that you bring into our path. We pray for the sick and the infirmed among us, for those who are dealing with temporal illnesses or facing the challenging prospects of longer-term illnesses, we ask your sustaining power and presence. For those facing life and death decisions, we pray for mercy and wisdom, power to withstand the temptations to anger or self-pity, power to do what is courageous and right in the face of dark providences, we pray for our caretakers as well, those that watch over those who are suffering. We ask, Father, that you give them stamina and mercy. We pray for our missionaries, particularly tonight. We lift up those who are training uh, the pastors for us. We think of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary, Twin Lakes Fellowship. Both are um, working to, to work with pastors to provide uh, past, uh, pulpits for them as well as to train them in their calling. We pray for other seminaries as well, for the Covenant Seminary in our own denomination, as well as other seminaries in the U.S. and around the world. Father, will you raise up godly men? We pray especially for teachers, that they would be godly men, calling their men to faithfulness and to accurate uh, exposition of the scriptures. We pray that you would provide financially for them to carry on uh, their responsibilities, and that, Lord, you would as well provide for families as the, these men go through the seminary training. We thank you for our presbytery and our denomination. We thank you, Father, for the recent General Assembly and for the, the good responses we saw there and for the encouraging votes that were taken. Lord, may you continue to protect the PCA. Give us wisdom in the years ahead as we continue to navigate through a, a darker and darker culture and try to figure out how to best respond to it in a way that doesn't compromise the standards of your word, but is still effective in reaching the lost. We pray, Father, for your church around the world, particularly the persecuted church. We pray, Father, that you would persevere, that they would persevere, and that they would be an aroma of Christ and his willingness to suffer for the glory of their heavenly Father. 
We pray for the leaders of our own country. We thank you, Father, for what has just transpired in our own country, the fall of the um, Roe versus Wade decision. Lord, we are so thankful for that, but we recognize the battle is not over. But we pray, Father, that this would be the beginning of other legislation that would be consistent with your word, that we would even see a revival uh, in the, uh, the church and that uh, you would continue to work through your spirit in the hearts of your people to bring the gospel uh, to this dark place. We pray, Father, that we could live quiet and peaceable lives as we minister to one another, to those that you providentially bring into our lives. And, Father, we pray again for the leadership of this country. We pray that you would draw them to Christ and that they would legislate according to your truth and your word. We pray, Father, now for the worship this evening as we continue to worship together. We ask that you grant us clarity of mind and hearts that are receptive to the truths that you reveal to us through your word. And we pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Once again, I ask you to please stand for the Old Testament reading. It's out of Haggai 1, verses uh, 1 through 11. Haggai 1, 1 through 11. Once again, hear the word of God. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house shall be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, saying, Is it time for your, you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring the wood and build the temple, that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore the heavens above you withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land and the mountains, and on the grain and the new wine and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's remain standing and sing together now hymn number 378. Look ye saints, the sight is glorious.
First off, let me encourage you that I have not given up on the book of Job just as we're getting to the good part. Some of you may have been in panic that we're going to stop before we get to God speaking. We're going to get there eventually. What we're just take, doing is taking a quick little side road here, one that's uh, appro- appropriate and needed just to, it, to give me a little more time to work on those very substantial passages. Uh, I was not originally scheduled to preach this evening. This is part of helping the kings get here. So while they were in uh, Birmingham last week for General Assembly, uh, we're just going to leave them there this weekend so they can pack up their stuff and get here. And so uh, rather than, than try to jump into to the book of Job and to that very substantial part from chapters 38 to 41 where God begins to finally speak into the life of Job, I thought it would be better to, to bring you something that I had occasion to work on a, a while back in a class uh, with Dr. Liam Gulliger, a former uh, conference speaker here at the church, and I thought it would be appropriate, uh, particularly in light of what Pastor Dodds mentioned uh, just a few moments ago, up to leading the, uh, the introducing the offering, and just the present uh, time and place in which we're living. Uh, if you're in the stock market, or if you are not in the stock market, the past few months have have not given you many reasons to be encouraged. Uh, Inflation is up, that means gas prices are up, diesel is up, uh, milk is out, uh, everything has gotten more expensive. Uh, And you are probably, as you are thinking about these things, probably your blood pressure is going up uh, because these things affect you in very real ways. And it's it's probably enough to even distract you from the sermon. You're no longer paying attention. You're thinking about, I've got to get home and tend to something else. Um, There are reasons for that, and, and, and I understand those concerns, and I think everyone's sympathetic to that. Um, Despite those present discouragements, I think you have many reasons to be encouraged. Uh, You, if you are in this room, you're probably doing better than a whole lot of people in Greenville County. And you're also doing a whole lot better than a lot of people around the world. You're certainly in the top 10% in terms of your prosperity. You're in the top 1% of the world in terms of how well you're doing financially in whatever condition you're in today. But that said, your problems are your problems. In this room this week, you have probably dealt with this distressing phone call from a spouse who needed to talk about, uh, about an issue with a bill or to talk about an issue with a child or to talk about some kind of problem or relationship that you're having with someone else. If you are someone who owns a home, then I suspect that you have light bulbs that are out and you probably have a leaky toilet somewhere that's bugging you. You have light bulbs that that need to be replaced. You have maybe a termite bond you're concerned that you haven't gotten and you really need to get to. Uh, You may have my recent nemesis, voles, in your front yard tunneling every portion of the yard. I think I've decided they're they're good for core aeration. Um, And I'm just going to embrace the voles, but it's not looked good so far. You may have cars that need tires. You have education decisions that are coming up. The summer is half over. You haven't even bought swimsuits yet. Uh, And it's time to buy school clothes. The point is, is that you're, you're, in spite of the present situation, you're living a relatively amazing life, but depending on the, the size, the scope, the breadth of your personal kingdom, you have concerns that follow you. They, they, they come to you. They speak to you at various inappropriate times. Even during the pastoral prayer, there may have been a thought that as Pastor Dodds was praying about, about the kingdom of God, there was something in your kingdom that intruded into it. And I say all that in order to make you sympathetic to what we're going to look at tonight in this This beginning portion of the book of the the prophet Haggai in verses 1 through 11. And so let me pray, and and, and then we're going to begin not by looking at Haggai, but beginning to look at the book of Ezra in order to introduce us to this passage. So let's pray and let's, let's ask the Lord's help for understanding. Our gracious God, we recognize that we are plagued by a multitude of concerns about our lives, about the things that you have blessed us with and made us stewards of, and we want to handle those things rightly. But we also want to keep those things in their place. And so tonight, Lord, we pray that as we contemplate this passage, that we would hear what your prophet would have to say, us, say to us, that we would hear our Lord speak and teach our hearts how to think and how to act. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. In 586 B.C., that is the, the infamous date in which the, 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 the city of Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians. The, at that time, the temple of God in, in the midst of Jerusalem was destroyed, and the people were carried off into captivity. All of this happened because of the sin of God's people that had piled up, the idolatry, the disloyalty that they had shown, the rebellion against God's law that, that had, had continued on and on. And again, again, 
wore out the Lord's patience until eventually he gave them the consequences they deserved. And yet, here we are in this book, in, in, in something less than a half century after the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, we have what is essentially a miracle taking place. And we read about it in Ezra chapter 1. If you want to, you can turn there. I'll read it for you. Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the, Lord, the, the, word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who is among you of all his people. May his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. So upon that proclamation, this, this pronouncement of this pagan king, in 536, the exiles return and they go back with a specific purpose. Their purpose in going back to Jerusalem is according to the purpose the king had given them, which was to rebuild the temple of God. And so in the first year, they start the project. This happens under the leadership of Zerubbabel. He's the, he's the governor. He's actually an heir of David. And also Joshua, who is the high priest. And within a year, they have restored the bronze altar where the sacrifices are made. And they've actually laid the foundation for the temple. We read in Ezra 3, 8. And everything is going great. But then shortly after, something happens. Again, if you're continuing in the book of Ezra, you come to chapter 4 and you find out that there are, there are a multitude of things that begin to go on. There are, there are changes in leadership. That These pagan leaders are, are going from one to another. There are different political kind of machinations, people that are working, conspiring. There, there are, in the realm of Judah, there are local oppositions, people who are not thrilled about the, this return of, the, of these Jews, these Israelites, back to their, their capital and the restoration. They don't want to see that prosper. There are a multitude of, of frustrations that take place to hinder the work. And so the work stops after a year. And the problem is, is that the work stays stopped. All the promise and that vigor that followed them and their, their, their initial return, that this, this, this work of the hand of God, this proclamation that, that has happened according to the word of God, all this excitement and energy is pulled out. And at the end of that time, there was only a foundation and a lonely altar. And this is the way that the temple complex would remain for the next 16 years. And so that brings us to where we are this evening. We're going to find in this passage three parts. If you want an outline for yourself, it's going to begin with an exchange of words in verses 1 through 4. And then in verses 5 through 6, there's going to be an evaluation of outcomes. And then in verses 9 through 11, we're going to see a priority of kingdoms. And so let's begin with that first part, an exchange of words. The, the Lord says and the people say is what we find in Haggai 1, verses 1 through 4. Go ahead and look in your Bibles there. And the preface reminds you that, that as with Moses, that the word that's being spoken is the word of the Lord. It's delivered by Haggai the prophet, but it is the Lord who is speaking. And what is the word that, that he's going to say? It says, the pro prophet begins in verse 2, Thus says the Lord of hosts, and we're reminded of who it is that's speaking. It's the mighty God who is, who is making his declaration. He is breaking into their, their experience in this world. And this tiny little humble group of people is actually hearing from the one who has made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything that is in them. He is speaking to them. He's making a de declaration to them. And he's, part of what he's saying to them is, is that he is their God. He's reminding them that the God of the universe is actually the, jo the God of the Jews who were there in Jerusalem. He's reminding them that they are a, a particular people. He is their Lord, not only their God, but he is their Lord, their, their, their covenant-making and keeping God who knows them as a people. And they have a particular history that goes along with that. They have a father who is Abraham, who is, who is called into a singular relationship with God, who is set apart from, from all the people of the world. And he's blessed, and there's this proclamation of blessing on him and on his descendants and they're going to be marked out by the sign of this covenant that he makes. And there's this, 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 this promise that they're going to expand. 
Still further, their history includes God's singular rescue of them as a people out of their bondage in Egypt. He does, does this, this thing that, that's just not seen anywhere else in history where there's a people who goes into captivity and they come out again whole and intact. He's the same, these are the same people who are rescued by the blood of the Lamb of the Passover. These are the same people who are given a, a land and a dwelling place according to a promise of God that is taken away from another people and given in particular to them. And they are the people, as we saw before, people who are blessed to have the presence of God. As he said, I am going to dwell with you. I'm going to make my house with you. I give you first the tabernacle. And then when you're settled and you're at peace in the land, I'm going to give you the temple, a place where I will make my name to dwell where I will meet with you, where you will know the forgiveness of sins and have the relationship confirmed that we have with one another. This is the Lord who is speaking to them. So what does he have to say? Well, look again at verse 2. It says, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. It's, It's ironic there that when the Lord speaks, he doesn't speak speak his word at first, but he speaks their word. He says, let me tell you what you're saying. And what they're saying is not good. This is, this is like most of the time in history where you have, you have the people of God rise up to speak, to say something with one voice. And sometimes it is glorious. Sometimes it is this, this breaking out in, in praise of God. Sometimes it is this, this confirmation that says, yes, we are your people. We will obey your laws. But so many times when the people break out, it's not good. And this is one of those occasions when it's not good. Their collective voice and attitude is to say this, the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Now, how how did Haggai know this? Well, it wasn't because he he conducted a survey that he he went around and he pulled the people and he said, how do people feel about rebuilding the Lord? Rebuilding the house of the Lord. The reason he knows this is because the Lord knows what's in the heart of man. You think what we're told in the Gospels about our Lord Jesus, it says, Jesus knew their thoughts. And he was able to say, why do you think evil in your hearts? This is a 100% accurate survey. It's God knowing exactly what is the attitude of the people as a whole in such way that the prophet can speak to them. It's what is exposed, what they believe, what they're saying in their hearts is, we don't think it's your time, God. They don't want to rebuild the house in Jerusalem, the house for God. The very reason that they had been brought back from their captivity was to go to return, even by the mouth of the pagan king, was to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild that house. Yet all they have to show 15 years later is a blank spot. A flat arrangement of stones on the ground, a blank canvas, and it's almost an insult to injury that, that's what, that they even built that much. Remember the words of Lord Jesus in Luke chapter 14, verse 27? He says, And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Think about this. Think about you know, maybe your own personal kingdom I was talking about before. Think about some of those unfinished projects that are hanging around. Think about what, what they say and what they declare about you. They say, I was just speculating. I was just kind of toying at this. They say, I, I mismanaged this project. I didn't, I, I, I didn't really plan this the way that I should have. They say, I'm too poor now to finish this work that, that should have been done. Yeah, there are definitely reasons we don't finish projects. There are some good excuses that are out there. But in this case, the Jews don't have any of those excuses. But the pagan nations around them were able to do that very thing. They're able to look and say, look, <laughs> look at those people. They came back. They thought everything was going so great. They thought they had all of the blessings of, uh, of the, this, other, this other king and kingdom. And now look where they are today. They're not really that committed to the cause. And why was that? Well, certainly they had work that went against them. There were things that were unforeseen. They had conspirators that that, that didn't want to see the work go on. But somehow they had been bound and they had been restricted and they had been cautioned and they had been warned. And somehow that turned into, it turned into being eased. Eased into a life of comfort and a life of self. So what more does the prophet say? Look at verses 3 and 4. It says, And the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, 
Now the Lord is going to speak. He's not going to quote and reveal what's in their heart. Now he's going to speak for himself. And he says to them, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? And this temple, literally this house, to lie in ruins. The Lord makes it very personal, doesn't he? He says three times in that sentence there, You, yourselves, your. If you go back to Genesis chapter 12, there's that, that unfortunate and that embarrassing episode with, with Abraham. I guess Abram, he's not called Abraham yet. If you were to look back there in Genesis 12, 11, you'll hear this. Abraham said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful appearance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, that I may live because of you. It's kind of an embarrassing episode in this, this, this man of faith. When, when there's a threat to his life, immediately all his thoughts turn not to the protection of his wife, but to the protection of himself. Me, my, my. And that's exactly what, what's, what's happened here with the Jews. They have become overly concerned about themselves. And they're being directly called out by the Lord. Is it a time for you yourselves? I think you understand this. There's that, that all too powerful internal locus of focus. You, me. We like to think about us some us. We are very good about putting all of our energies into thinking about ourselves. Our progress, our comfort, our ease, our hunger. Those things drive us. It's natural. And there are some times where you need to think about you. When you're on the, on the flight and, and the oxygen mask you know, drops down, put it on yourself first. Then help the child next to you. Sometimes you need to get your car fixed before you give any money to your neighbor because you've got to keep your job or you're not going to have any money to give to your neighbor. You've got to get yourself dressed and ready on Sunday mornings, right, before you help the kids because you could be in a real predicament if you don't do that first. The kids, you know, somehow they're ultimately going to take care of themselves and it will be enough, but you've got to take care of you. But that's not what's being said here. What he is talking about is something much more profound, something that's much more at odds. Look at, again at verse 4. He says, Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Again, the ESV is better here. It reminds us that in that second verse, there's something rhetorical going on here. It doesn't say that this temple lies in ruins. He says this house. He says there's two houses. There's your house and then there's my house. And which one doesn't look so good? Your house looks wonderful. You live in a paneled house. There's a time where we read about paneled houses. If we go back to 1 Kings chapter 6, we read about Solomon and the, the work that goes on in building the temple, the, the temple that existed before it was destroyed. And it took seven years to build that temple. We read this in 1 Kings 6. It says, And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. And then we read in verse 9, So he built the temple and finished it, and he paneled the temple with beams and boards of cedar. Now, it doesn't seem like a profound statement, but it says something about, about the, the nature of what was designed and how glorious the temple was, that, the, that this was part of the provision, that the last, the finishing touch on the temple was that it was paneled. That, that, that would make it all the more glorious when this, this took place, but that was the last but part to, in order to finish it. But when you look at their lives and their present situation in, in, in Jerusalem at this time, is they're all living themselves in paneled houses. Looking out their windows from their paneled houses at the parking lot where the temple should have been. They built their houses first. They paneled them too. And the worship of God is taking place in a parking lot. The problem is in essentials. It's not, it's not that they didn't have things that, that, that they needed and that was part of the plan in order for them to get back. But it's all the extras. It's what they've given themselves to and what they've determined to abandon. See, God, God doesn't want the, this kind of artless, you know, communist utilitarianism where we, you know, we have nothing that we can enjoy, nothing is pretty, everything is just, just austere. That, that's not the plan. But the question is the priority. What is being neglected and what's being neglected is the house of God. They've made a choice between those two houses, and the one has been neglected. Why is this such a big deal? 
Because God's plan for his people was a permanent house. Turn your Bibles back to Deuteronomy chapter 12. Deuteronomy is this book in which Moses is restating the law of God for his people. He is reminding them of the the, the covenant that obligations that they've taken on. And he's speaking it to a new generation of people, ones who are actually not going to die in the wilderness, but those who are going to go into the land of the promise. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, he reminds them of, of, of how they are distinct in the, the laws and the, the, the statutes which belong to them. And how they're distinct in the land that they're being given. And he's reminding them that when you go into that land, you need to destroy everything that would attack your loyalty to me. Because I want all of you. I want your worship exclusively and not shared with anyone else or anything else. And then he tells them this in verse 4. He says, You shall not worship the Lord your God with such things, but you shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses out of all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling place, and there you shall go. There you shall take your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings of your hand, your vowed offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice in all to which you have put your hand, you and your household's in which the Lord your God has blessed you. He says there's going to be a permanent place where I'm going to make my dwelling with you, where you're going to worship me in all these ways which I prescribe for you to do, you and your households, as I bless you. He goes on, he says, You shall not at all do as we are doing here today, every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. For as yet you have not come to the rest and the inheritance which the Lord your God is giving you. But when you cross over the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and he gives you rest from all your enemies round about, so that you dwell in safety, then there will be the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. There you shall bring all that I command you. And you shall, he says in verse 12, And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your sons and your daughters, your male and female servants, and the Levite who is within your gates, since he has no portion or inheritance with you. He's reminding them, this is the place. And where are they now? They have been brought back by the command of this pagan king. They have been given rest. They are in a place of safety. They're doing well. So much so that they can build houses and they can have their houses paneled, but they're still choosing to let his house be in ruin. And what have they deprived themselves? They have cut themselves off from the communion that he designed for his people. The Lord intends to dwell with his people. He wants that fellowship, but not having that house as this marker that says, I'm not with you. And it's a, it's, a, it's a declaration from them that's saying, it's not that important that we know that you're here. And so the Lord's intention is that they not be happy apart from him. They not be comfortable without that temple, that dwelling place where he may be worshipped rightly. So we've seen two speakers, we've seen two houses, and now there are two outcomes laid out for us here. Look at verses 5 and 6. Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, you have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put it into a bag with holes. The people expected and the reason they expect it is because these people aren't dumb. They're, they're not unscientific. They understood how the world worked. These were people who had a, a good work ethic. They were fulfilling their proper roles in life. They had vocations. They were doing what, what, what your dad probably taught you, what my dad taught me, what I taught my son. Get a job, work hard, make money, don't be a freeloader because nobody likes that. That's good. But the problem is they assumed They made the assumption that they had the formula that that would work and was sufficient to work for them in life. And if they followed the formula, if they worked hard, then they would put the seeds in the ground and out would come crops, out would come full barns, out would come happy kids, out would come full bellies and a comfortable life. And this, friends, is where we need to wrestle for a bit. We need to think about how much we tend to think this way. There are reasons we think that way. It gets reinforced. We're told that from from the time we're a child. We, we see it encouraged and built up. We, we find ourselves compensated when we do good work, when we lean hard, when we push further, when we, we work longer. I don't think it's the problem that most of us have is being lazy. We're, you know, we're not millennial kids. All of you are saying, I'm not like them. 
But does that mean you're right with God? Does that mean you're doing what pleases Him? You see, you have a problem when you think there is a law of nature that owes you good. In fact, that is asking for trouble to say that I am owed good. And it's, that's the way it always has to work out. That's retribution theology. That's what we've been talking about with the book of Job. That's why we need to take longer to read that answer from God when we come to it in chapter 38. You see, wisdom is not present here in the way they're acting. Even though they're doing all these things that are generally commendable, we find out that they are expecting, but the Lord is withholding. There's no return in their investment. That, that 12% 401k return they were promised annually, not going to be there. Miracle growth, sprinkle a whole lot of it. Nothing good is happening on the other side of it. Overtime work not being compensated at time and a half. They left in the captivity, they came to Jerusalem, and all those things that seemed to be going in the right direction, the, the joy and light, the, the milk and honey, the peace and prosperity, those things aren't happening. They have empty barns, hunger and thirst, chilly winters, and empty bank accounts. Look in verse 5, we find there is a reason these things are, are taking place. It says, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And literally, in, in, in the Hebrew, he says, set your heart on your ways. He's saying it's time for self-reflection. Why was I put into the land? Why was I called to go to this place? What, for what reason what, was I delivered from that captivity? Was it so you could be healthy and happy? Was, was it so that you didn't have to be embarrassed about being a stranger in a strange land, not having friends where you were? Was it so that you would find heaven on earth? And actually, the answer to that last question is yes, is they were supposed to find heaven on earth. They were going to be a part of it because that's what the prophet had, had called them back to do, is they were to go back and, and build that temple that was to represent heaven on earth. He said that he would be found and he would give them those things that they desired when they desired him. He was, he was willing to give them more of himself. And so he reminds them that there is a priority of kingdoms here. We see this in, in, in verses 7 through 11. And the first, the first priority, the one that they've been showing, is that kingdom of self. And every time you, you go for the kingdom of self, that's going to be an empty investment. Listen again to verses 9 through 11. You look for much, and behold, it came to little. When you brought it home, I blew it away. That's rough. But that's the way it works. Self is a bottomless pit, and you know it. Self has an insatiable appetite. No matter how much you feed it, it never gets full. It takes as much as you give it. it. It makes promises that it never delivers on. It can't bless. It won't make you content. It's never satisfied. And self has no path to joy. If they had listened to the words of the preacher in Ecclesiastes, they would know this. He says in Ecclesiastes 2.10... Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure... For my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil I had expected in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. He says, all was, all was fleeting, all was ephemeral, all was just, just emptiness. No matter how hard I worked, no matter what I gave myself to, how much I, I fed those desires that were in my heart and in my flesh... None of those were rewarded. And that's the grace of the Lord to withdraw blessings, to take away our joy from those things when we're going and trying to satisfy self. Does not Jesus say, blessed are the poor, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. That's where the blessings are. And so if the Lord's house lies in ruins, what would you expect? And so he tells them in verses 7 and 8, something that Jesus is going to tell us. He says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways, go up to the hills and bring wood, and build the house that I may take pleasure in it, that I may be glorified, says the Lord. If they build the house, they will glorify him. They will have joy in him. He will receive joy from them. And of course he will. Because what, what's the temple about? It's not, it's not just like, like a, you know, a, a wonder of the world for, for people to spectate it. It is a gospel picture. There's one gate that goes into it, and that points us forward to Christ, who is the door, the one way to the Lord. 
There's an altar for atonement that, that, that's, that's part of the structure where the people, people bring their sacrifices, reminding us of the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. There's a laver for washing. You think about our Lord Jesus Christ, whose, whose ministry began when he himself was washed in his baptism and who would go on to wash his disciples to set them apart for their work and ministry. There's a holy place where communion takes place between God and man, where there's a bread of the presence reminding us of the one who is the bread of life. There's the the golden lampstands reminding us of the one who is the light of the world. There's the altar for incense reminding us of, of, of those prayers which are offered by our Lord Jesus that go up to heaven on our behalf. There's the Ark of the Covenant which is which contains the law of God which is our tutor to Christ. It reminds us of Jesus who kept the law perfectly in every way, who did his Father's will in all points. That picture was important. It was vital to them. It's how they would know their sins were atoned for, and yet they, they were content to leave it. At, we, can, we can get by with just an altar. We did, all we wanted the sacrifices. We just want our sins taken away, but we don't want the fellowship. We don't want the communion with the Lord. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, that's not really my problem because I'm in the New Covenant. And I don't need a temple anymore. And you're right. You don't need that physical structure. But you absolutely do need a temple. And you have a temple. And we're reminded of this multiple times in the scripture. That there is a dwelling place for God among us. Jesus in his upper room discourse said in John 14, 16. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. You have a temple and God dwells with you in that temple. Romans 8 verse 9. You however are not in the flesh but in the spirit. If in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you although the body is dead because of sin. The spirit of life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And Paul makes it abundantly clear. He says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Again, in Ephesians 2.22, in him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So friends, what, what's the state of your temple? And does it lie in ruins? I want to be clear, this is not a kickoff for a building campaign. Just, just to be clear, this is not where we were going with this. If you have money, great, give it, super. That's not the point. You're missing the point entirely if you think that brick and mortar and and stones and parking lots are the way to answer the call of God from this passage. Is your temple in ruins because of spiritual neglect? When you talk about prayer on Sunday but give the Lord only tokens before dinner, is that the extent of your prayer life? Is that black book that's probably around your lap somewhere right now, is that just for today Or is that coming out during the rest of the week so that you can hear the word of God as an active part of your life? Do you have any kinds of of fasting that take place in your life that, that, that make you know that there is a communion with God to be desired above all the things of this world? Fathers, I would ask you, what what's the state of your home? Not your you know, not your termite bond or the cracks in your driveway or any of those kind of things, but how is your wife doing spiritually? Are you communing with her? Are you having conversations with her? Are you asking her and and checking on her spiritual condition? And certainly, are you digging into the lives of your children? Are you bringing the word to them? Is is the Spirit of God present in your home? Would any any stranger who who, who came into your house know that you love the Lord your God? Or they think "These these are nice people. Whether you're married or single or a parent or a child, it doesn't matter. Are you making excuses and selecting other priorities than doing that work that needs to be done, that spiritual work, that heavenly kingdom work that belongs much nearer to the center of your life than it is right now? I ask you, are you prioritizing the body of Christ, this temple, this dwelling place of God? You promise to support the church and its worship and work to the best of your ability. How's that promise going? 
Is it time for repentance? Is there more that you need to give? More ways you need to, get, to dig in? More ways that you need to be intentional about the body of Christ? And elders, let me make sure that you don't think you're off the hook. Look back at Haggai chapter 1 and verse 1. You really don't want to miss this part. It says, The word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. The word came first to the leaders of God's people. They were the first ones to hear the prophet speak. The prophet's declaration came to them. And why? Because they had left the people to themselves. They had gone their own way. They had become comfortable with the status quo. They had made strategic decisions to abandon the people of God to say, you know what, we're just really not going to push this. It's just not that important that, 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 that people be steered towards completing this work that would bring, the commun- bring us communion with the Lord. We had, we had a debate in our session. Uh, I'm probably not supposed to share this kind of thing, but I'm just going to anyway, so um, I, I'll ask for forgiveness later. We had a debate in our session uh, several months back, and, and the debate was on a, on a topic of the, the, the timing of the service. And I'm not, uh, I'm not prejudicing any outcomes here, just, just no in advance, I, I'm not, you know, no intentions in that direction. But we, we had a debate, and I'm not going to name names. I'm going to try not to. It might just slip out. <laughs> but, but there was one of the younger kind of curmudgeonly elders um, that, that was part of this debate, and he was very much on the wrong side of it. Um, <laughs> And it, it was a discussion about moving the time of the evening service. And as we talked about it, um, th- there were a multitude of reasons that, that in my, I have a lot of wisdom, um, that I felt like it would, be, it would be good to move this. And this, this younger curmudgeonly elder, um, say it again, just to be clear, um, he, he argued against me for some reason, and he had two points. And his two points were this. Uh, the first point was, this has been the time of our evening service since the church was founded almost 40 years ago. And there's something to that. And his second argument was, it's an in- inconvenient time, and it messes with naps and dinner and getting ready for school. And that inconvenience says something about our priorities. And I thought I was stupid, and I was mad, and I was humbled, and I repented. Uh, because I was on the wrong side. And after hearing that, I recognized that there was a priority in what this elder was saying. And it was embarrassing and convicting because, again, I'm not saying there's some absolute number that's, that's more holy one than the other. But those priorities to say that it inconveniences us to do something on the Lord's day, that's good. Because it says something about our priorities. It says it's okay to hurt a little in this area. It's okay to suffer a little bit in this area. It's okay to be denied something that's very comfortable and easy for me and for my whole clan because I have a higher priority. And that priority is the worship of God. Leaders have to lead into the kingdom. This is what the Apostle Paul said. Brothers, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. He owns you. You belong to Christ. There's not a higher price that could be paid. He deserves that you meet morning and evening on the Lord's day. Whatever inconvenient time. We should actually make it even later and earlier just to punish ourselves more so it's clear we have our priorities right. Let me finish up with a word from a 16th century prophet. Uh, You may have heard of this man. His name is John Calvin. And he wrote probably the most sermonic part of... The Institutes of the Christian Religion, Book 3. He says this, and this is long, and I don't care because I want you to suffer too so you can feel like you're doing something spiritual. So we're just going to keep pushing that theme. But it's worth hearing. Calvin writes, Even though the law of the Lord provides the finest and best disposed method of ordering a man's life, it seemed good to the heavenly teacher to shape his people by an even more explicit plan to that rule which he had set forth in the law. Here then is the beginning of this plan. The duty of believers is to present their bodies to God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to Him. And in this consists the lawful worship of Him. From this is derived the basis of the exhortation that they not be conformed to the fashion of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of their minds, so that they may prove what is the will of God. That you know is Romans 12, 1 and 2. 
who goes on, he says, Now the great thing is this, we are consecrated and dedicated to God in order that we may thereafter think, speak, meditate, and do nothing except to His glory. For a sacred thing may not be applied to profane uses without marked injury to Him. If then we are if then if we then are not our own, but the Lord's, it is clear what error we must flee and whither we must direct all the acts of our life. We are not our own. Let not our reason nor our will therefore sway our plans and deeds. We are not our own. Let us therefore not set it as our goal to seek what is expedient for us according to the flesh. We are not our own. Insofar as we can, let us therefore forget ourselves and all that is ours. Conversely, we are God's. Let us therefore live for him and die for him. We are God's. Let his wisdom and will therefore rule all our actions. We are God's. Let all the parts of our life accordingly strive toward him as our only lawful goal. Oh, how much has that man profited who, having been taught that he is not his own, has taken away dominion and rule from his own reason that it may yield it to God. For as consulting our self-interest is is the pestilence that most effectively leads to our destruction, so the sole haven of salvation is to be wise in nothing and to will nothing through ourselves, but to follow the leading of the Lord alone. My friends, this is what our Lord Jesus Christ taught us when he said, O you of little faith, therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all, but seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Let's pray together. Our Father, we confess before you that we love our own kingdoms, and we give far too much attention to all the parts and details of our lives. We meditate on them far too much, and we make few plans for your sake. We make few plans to edify our brethren. We, we, make few, we give few thoughts, Lord, to seeking your glory and how we can do it better still. Oh, Lord, we pray that you would forgive us and that you would cleanse us for Christ's sake and that your spirit who does indwell us would so indwell us that we would know and do your will, that we would love your kingdom and its appearing and that we would give ourselves more fully to it. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's now respond to the word by taking our Trinity Psalter hymnals. We'll turn to Psalm 102b and stand together and sing... Thou, O Lord, art God alone. That's Psalm 102b.
remind you, following the benediction, we will have the high time outside. I'll explain those instructions to you following the benediction. Hear now the Lord's blessing and benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Please remain standing. Let me explain just very quickly. We do want to uh, honor our elderly among us, and so we're going to let them uh, go in the front of the line. And so as you're making your way down the hall, we ask the, the children, please do not run. Uh, and I would suggest probably the easiest way, let the elderly folks on the left side of the hallway going down to the gym. We're going to go in the second entrance. If you're not sure if you're elderly, basically Pastor Carl and above. <laughs> That's, that will help you. And so uh, work your way down the hallway. A uh, couple of other things. We will not be doing a prayer because it's just so hard in the hallway there. So go in and enjoy your time of fellowship. Uh, the doors will be closed initially. Once we kind of get the line together to get the elderly folks up front, we'll open those doors and it will work pretty expeditiously. There's a couple of lines there. So you are dismissed. We'll see you in a moment. <laughs>